Uh, my name is Casey McKinney. I'm one of the vice presidents of the Prison Education Awareness Club here at ASU. And I am also an education volunteer at Perryville Prison. I teach, whoop, yeah, Perryville. <laughs> I teach creative writing, um, so screenwriting this semester, which is really fun. And I also teach art to the juveniles that are at Perryville who are tried as adults. Um, I know personally that teaching um, at Perryville is one of the most fulfilling experiences that I've ever had. And it's definitely shaped my intentions for my future. So I'm very excited to speak to my fellow ASU students and faculty members who share the same experience as me. Uh, some of them are familiar to me, but some of them aren't. So I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves to you. You guys can just say your name, what you teach, where you teach, you know, what you do at ASU, et cetera. I guess I'm start on. There, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Aubrey Spivey. Um, I'm a second year PhD student in the philosophy department in the School of Historical Shippers. I don't remember all the acronyms. Um, I teach at Iman facility and I teach philosophy. Uh, this semester we're covering sort of a survey course, so that's been, that's been kind of fun. Hi, I'm Winter Roth. I'm an undergraduate student. I'm majoring in biochemistry and psychology, um, but I teach at the Perryville unit this semester. And I'm teaching, they call it a business skills course, but I think it's more vocational skills, resume building, interview building skills, things like that. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Stephen Hart. I'm a fifth year PhD student in environmental engineering. Um, I teach with a group of other students in the Iman prison, we teach a biology class. Hi, I'm Gable Taggart. I completed my PhD last semester. I was in the School of Public Affairs. My PhD is in Public Administration and Policy. Uh, last semester at the prison, I taught organizational behavior. And then right now, I'm teaching Intro to Public Affairs at the Lawrence East Unit. Hi, my name is Nancy Gomez. And I am a Spanish PhD student with a uh, concentration in Chicano and Chicano literature and culture. And I am teaching Spanish at, the, at Perryville. Hi there, everybody. Uh, my name is Connor Sirovich. I am a third year MFA student here in the creative writing department. Uh, I teach an introductory fiction writing workshop at Florence's East Unit. Uh, my name is Nathan Young. Uh, I graduate this semester, undergraduate, um, majoring in English. But um, I teach philosophy at Florence Central Unit. Awesome, I think we have some more microphones here too. That'll be helpful. All right, so I want to start with, I feel like, what would be the obvious question um, to begin with, which is what motivated you guys to start teaching in a prison? It is such, I think, um, a singular experience, and it takes a certain person to be drawn to that. Um, well, my dissertation is actually on like the ethics of incarceration, so I've kind of been interested in the question of reform and education and moral education uh, for a long time. I think the thing that got me started was an accidental criminology course where I started realizing that uh, discussions associated with how to uh, reform prisons were deeply informed by philosophical concerns. And I, I was sort of motivated by the fact there didn't seem to be much communication there and that we could do a lot of good in the world if we bridged that kind of communication between really abstract thinking and uh, very applied on the ground policy. Um, I got interested through Dr. Wells, which I'm sure most people up here have. Um, she kind of has a sixth or seventh sense for people who would be interested in it and really pulls them into the program. I took her English class my freshman year, and she emailed me that summer and asked if I would be interested in the Penn Project, and I was. I did that for a year and a half until I decided I wanted to teach directly in the prison. So this semester, I started teaching at the Perryville unit. I've loved the whole experience there. Um, I've been teaching for four years of uh, the biology class, and I'm in prison. I think when we first started, we, we have a whole group of teachers. It's a little bit different than some of the other classes. Two of us go at a time, and we team teach each lesson. And we rotate out teachers. 
Um, and we first went because we thought this was an excellent opportunity as educators to get become better educators. We thought the kind of limitations and would spur us to be more innovative in our teaching style. We keep going uh, because, like Pastor Benny and Mr. Perez said, uh, the students are excellent. Uh, they they inspire us and they ask excellent questions, and we you know become better teachers. And every year we get better because of them. So uh, I came to ASU for my PhD because I wanted to study, study higher education policy um, in a place where Michael Crow was, because you know, ASU, number one in innovation, blah, blah. Um, so one day I was, I was looking at education data and I came across incarceration, uh, people who were incarcerated in education levels, and I was pretty appalled. So I actually came at this from the higher education side. Um, and so then, I also came, came at a time in my life when I didn't feel like my research was really making an impact, and so I was kind of looking out for, you know, what's something that can, that can make an impact. Um, just Googled prison education, Arizona State, and Corey came up. <laughs> uh, went and met with her, and, you know, a m couple months later I was in a prison teaching organizational behavior. <laughs> Well, I know I wanted to do some volunteer work before I left Arizona, and I tried to look into different places, and I emailed them and they never answered back, and I was like, well, I guess I'll just have to stick to being around college students all the time, until I received an email from Dr. Wells, and I told her I was very, very interested in them. Um, I think that my motivation was uh pretty simple. I uh, see my future as an education and uh, I've had a lot of opportunities in my program to teach uh, first year composition and a couple of creative writing courses but I was really looking to kind of widen my horizons and being able to have the opportunity to grow as a teacher and an educator uh, in my specific field which is creative writing um, has been absolutely amazing teaching a diverse population of individuals uh, like I have in my creative writing classroom has been fantastic, and being able to be of some service while I do that is pretty phenomenal. Um, my motivation was birthed when I was um, trying to find a, um, an area of focus for my graduate work. And I was really interested in race studies, but I wanted to find something more of a niche, and I've been reading slave narratives, so prison literature was pretty relevant. So I started um, digging into that, and then um, I'm interested in the Michelle Alexander aspect of it, but more so like the Foucault part of it, like why it is we discipline people the way we do, how that translates into actual behavior, hierarchies of power, whatnot. And um, it just seemed clear to me that one of the first steps to take was to sort of like encourage a sort of uh, like osmosis between the community and currently formerly incarcerated people. So um, I looked into it and through Corey's programs, wherever she is, um, like everyone else, that's where I started. So I know a lot of us have experience both teaching in a university environment or some other kind of uh, education environment not in prison, as well as our experience in prison. And I know personally that there is a huge difference in those environments. And I was hoping that you guys could discuss both the pros and the cons of those differences and, and what it's like. How do you change your teaching styles for those environments, or maybe how you don't? Um, a really good question. I think the ways in which they're similar is that there's a thirst for knowledge and maybe this is like uh, the people that sign up for philosophy are, are definitely doing so because uh, they have a curious like nature about them and they want to know uh, a bunch of questions and maybe some answers to those questions. So I find that they're both very inquisitive both uh, on the inside and the outside. But I actually think there's more critical thinking that happens with uh, persons on the inside. Maybe that's a function of the fact that, given their circumstances, they've had to reflect more on what they have, what they don't have, the struggles uh, that produced the sort of environments that they existed in, and the notion of consequence and uh, causation. And so I find that they've, they come to the classroom already with a very deep reflection on life and a lot of the really important big questions concerning it. So I, I find that that's 
not something I expected actually, um, for them to be more, more engaged than a lot of the undergraduate classes I've had to, the opportunity to teach. But it's certainly been an awe-inspiring uh, opportunity to get to work with these people and like present them with some literature that is associated with the kinds of questions they've already formed on their own. I think one of the biggest pros of working in the Perryville unit, or I also volunteered in the Globe unit for a little bit, um, is the motivation behind the individuals there. They're so motivated to come to class to do their work. I've worked with children for a long time, and they're forced to go to your class by their parents. So they don't want to participate, and they don't always want to be there. But especially for creative writing, which I taught at the Globe Men's Unit, they were always so willing to share their work that they had come up with in, in five minutes, which is kind of a terrible thing for university students to think about having to share something you came up with in five minutes. It's not perfect. Um, but it, it is really hard as well because there's so many restrictions on what you can bring into your classroom. Um, and you really take that for granted on the outside. You can bring in any activity you want. You can bring in any materials that you want. But for the prison, you really have to jump through a lot of hoops to bring in things. And I know we're all willing to do it. It's just something you take for granted as a teacher on the outside versus a teacher on the inside. I think um, one major difference in terms of uh, an outside class, and a class at ASU or a cl the class we teach in the prison would be uh, in biology and in a lot of the sciences, and I'm sure it's similar for other classes as well, but it builds on other classes. And so nobody takes a biology class first. They take a chemistry class or a physics class. And so we found that adapting to that, to a single class of science um, is, is difficult, but um, very achievable. You just have to change the way you structure your class and the way it works. Um, some uh, challenges would be uh, we sometimes have, by necessity, students will leave our class to go to a different unit. Um, it happens probably to everyone, and it happens in every semester. Uh, you know, prison isn't organized on a semester-based system, it turns out, and so that makes it difficult sometimes, um, because uh, we have to be flexible about whether we, like in a university class, you wouldn't let someone in halfway through, but in, in prison you probably would, because they might not have another opportunity. Um, so that's a challenge. Uh, a, another benefit, you mentioned the differences in the students. Uh, I've never, it's kind of intimidating when you first start teaching because I've never had like more than 20 or 30% of the people paying attention to me at once in a class <laughs> of the teaching. But in these classes, everyone is. And that's, you know, it's good, but it takes a while to get used to. <laughs> so I teach organizational behavior at ASU. And the average student in that class is a mid-career professional or early career professional who's gonna be a manager in a public organization. Not the same demographic as a, as a prison population. So when I, when I came in, I was kind of wondering, how, how am I gonna approach this class? Um, in organizational behavior, we teach with a lot of case studies, and the case studies are geared towards practicing uh, you know, soft skills in certain situations in an organization. Uh, the one thing the prisoners do have, or the inmates have, is they have a lot of organizational experience, right? And so they're super insightful. Um, another kind of philosophical question I had coming into the class was, am I gonna kind of focus on skills? Or gonna kind of take a step back and just talk about theory? And I really struggled at first. I didn't know where I landed. Um, you know, there's a, there's a great argument for skills, and I definitely agree that they, that, that they want to build skills so they can go actually go get a job when they leave. But I kind of saw this as an opportunity to focus on theory a little bit more. You know, things like the typical things in a class, of organizational behavior, motivation, decision making. And as they kind of struggled with the theories of motivation, decision making, you know, I saw them sort of building that mental flexibility that you kind of hope to see in students. And uh, so that was kind of a cool experience. So I always have people tell me learning Spanish is very hard, or learning a second language is very, very hard. 
So I've been teaching for a couple of years now, high school, middle school, now uh, here at ASU. And I've always had to kind of like joke around with them, push them, uh, contact their parents here in college. It's like, I'll give you a second chance. I'll give you a third chance. Please turn it in. I have to like literally beg them to turn in their assignments or to participate in class. So when I signed up to teach at Perryville, I was like, well, this is going to be volunteer work. I'm not only going to be the one volunteering, but our, my students will be volunteering to come into my class. So it was very interesting to first, it was going to be a Spanish one class once a week for two hours. We weren't going to have any internet access, no textbook, no nothing except whatever I gave them once a week. So at first it was very scary for me to kind of go in there and hopefully convince them to stay in my class, and they did stay. And then having to actually speak in Spanish, and they did. And then the other challenge was to actually make them write essays, and they did. And then at the end of the semester, or last semester, I told them, I was like, okay, we already had quizzes too that you passed and you did not leave blank. You already had short conversations. You already wrote these short essays with no previous knowledge in Spanish before this. And at the end, they had like short four to five minute conversations all in Spanish. So for me, that was like something I really, I was really, really excited about. It was like there was a lot of things that were kind of like hinting me that they weren't going to learn anything besides hola, como estas? But they did much more than that. So that kind of compensated with the cons. Um, I'd say that one of the big similarities that I find as a creative writing teacher between undergraduates here at ASU and the uh, prison inmates has been the level of enthusiasm uh, since creative writing, I, I started teaching as a first-year composition teacher, which, uh, and if you guys don't know, that's a required course here at ASU. And uh, I'd say 90% of my job is just getting anybody at all interested in writing or language arts at any level. Um, and creative writing, I remember feeling uh, quite surprised by the degree of enthusiasm in both situations, both the undergraduates and the prison inmates. Um, I'd say the biggest difference between those situations, and there are some profound differences in teaching in either of those environments, uh, at least teaching creative writing, but uh, one of the biggest differences is that with undergraduates, um, you know, you can imagine the uh, 18, 19 year old person who is um, terrified here as a college student, um, terrified just generally um, in a creative writing classroom, uh, and most of what I'm doing is trying to get them to come out of their shells a little bit, you know. Um, I can't tell you how many undergraduates I've said to, uh, uh, there's always this moment in an undergraduate short story where the character, the main character, uh, thinks about saying something but doesn't. Um, and I always have to say, hey, we're all introverts here. Most people say what's on their mind. Um, the prison inmates never have that problem, <laughs> ever. <laughs> and I think it's partly maturity um, and partly uh, uh, the fact that um, most of the men that I teach are a fair bit older and certainly do say what's on their mind. Um, so oftentimes I have to ask them to maybe pull it back a little bit and say, hey, you know, maybe we need to develop this plot a little bit before we get to the point where um, someone's murdering someone else or um, <laughs> uh, uh, this big extreme event is happening. Um, <laughs> um, there are a lot of other profound differences, but uh, just one that I found significant. Um, I've only taught out of prison, so I um, can't speak much on my teaching differences. But um, the, what I have noticed is that these students come of their own volition, and the level of like engagement and just enthusiasm for the content is just its different than the dynamic I've seen in my own classes. and. Um, in a context where they've pretty much lost all their autonomy, um, the flexibility of like um, the course structure um, is really helpful because I can, it's, I, I'm allowed to let them learn about things that they want. Like I let them, I have some core concepts that I teach, but aside from that, they suggest it, and then we just um, go into depth on those subjects. So um, that's been really helpful. And the ADC has been super um, compliant, <clears throat> compliant at least in my experience. I'd like to talk about teaching humanities in prison. I'm teaching screenwriting this semester, which seems kind of frivolous. Um, in fact, I 
talk to my parents about that, and they're like, why are you teaching screenwriting in a, in a prison? Like, that seems pointless. Um, but I would totally say au contraire. Um, so <laughs> I'd like some of you guys who teach humanities classes to speak about the benefits and the value of teaching philosophy or creative writing in an environment where most people would like to see um, that time and money go to more practical classes. I feel like the humanities in particular are really good at developing toolkits as opposed to like sets of information. So it may appear that you know when I teach, um, you know, what's the categorical imperative in Kant's groundwork, and how does this relate to the notion of uh, personal autonomy and rationality? That doesn't sound like it's something that's going to help you get a job because it's not. <laughs> uh, not even in philosophy is that going to help you. But what matters is that by thinking about these really hard questions and sort of taking a step back from your embedded position and thinking in the abstract, you get the opportunity to think critically and develop skills about uh, how things relate, right? So if you're the cause of something happening, right, what comes out to be autonomy such that you're responsible for your action? And this turns out these kinds of questions are general, but turn out to be very impactful and important for people within prison because they're, they're already struggling with these kinds of questions and these kinds of concepts. And so I think that for the humanities, what should matter is that we're teaching them skills that they can take into any context, into any job, with any information, and be able to employ them. And I think that's really valuable. I teach one of the um, quote unquote practical courses. Um, so <laughs> I'll talk very quickly. Um, I teach a business skills course, so a lot of our first month of teaching has been very much based around resume building for all of my students. And one of the things that I really noticed the first time that me and my co-teacher took their resumes from them was the differences in skills all of them had. Some of them didn't have a high school degree and other ones had been medical assistants before they were arrested. So the differences on their resumes and their writing abilities was just insanely different. So I think it's really important to have classes like philosophy and creative writing to have them build those skills, as Aubrey said, and be able to be on the same level as anyone else when they go to write their resume or they go into an interview so that they can sound um, poignant and get those positions that they may not necessarily um, be on the same level as. I, I suppose I also teach a practical class, although I don't know how biology would always fit into that. But in, it's, I'd say some of the stuff that we do is uh, very practical. You could say it'd be like um, talking about vaccines, talking about uh, nutrition and things like that, like how your body gets energy. Um, some of it is very, very not. It's very abstract and I think has some similarities with the humanities courses in that respect that the benefits of talking about something like evolution or something about you know, behavior um, can be intrinsically beneficial and is some of the most, the things, the topics that our students are most interested in actually. So organizational behavior is a soft skill. So I guess you could say it's a skill, but like I said earlier, I, I, I kind of decided to take a step back and really talk about theory in the class. Partly I think for the same argument, you know, as the philosophers is, that sort of mental flexibility that you, you build when you're trying to deal with these tough concepts and tough theories. Um, and so, you know, talking about, say, decision making, and I teach them about bounded rationality. And, you know, when you make a decision, you are bounded by your time and cognitive abilities to process information. Comparing that with rationality, and now they're thinking, okay, decisions I make, which model of decision making am I using? Um, I think that is a very, very powerful thing to learn um, and really helps mid-career professionals, but I think really could help someone in, the, in a prison system as well. Um, so, like I said, I really do, I do agree that, you know, skills are very important, but I think for people like us who show up and we're PhD students, we're, we're in the world of theory, we're talking about theory, there's a real value added having someone who's in that world wanting to talk about theory with the inmates. And uh, 
So that was kind of my conclusion was what can I bring the most that they don't, they're not gonna get anywhere else. And that was talking about theory. Um, and I'm seeing Lay nod her head and she sits in my class and, and sometimes listens and um, she does a great job teaching them, you know, GD and skills and things like that. And I come in and I'm completely different. You know, I'm like, let's have a discussion. <laughs> Let's talk about theory, and and you know it's a nice. I think it's a nice mix for them. So I believe that learning any language is useful, Spanish especially here in the uh, U.S. Southwest. But um, more than learning it just because you want to get a better job, I think it's something more complex. So it. Learning Spanish, in my opinion, I believe it helps you to understand uh, more of your population, uh, the people you're around with. You're able to communicate, which in my opinion is very, very important in languages for you to be able to communicate with other people, to expand, not just look straightforward, but to see the different sides of, of a situation, especially now with everything that's going on in politics, the government, everything. I believe that it's more than just receiving a better job or being able to speak to your friend. It's being able to develop that human side. Um, well, as a creative writing teacher, I teach probably the least practical thing possible. Um, at least, uh, I'm speaking from the perspective of perhaps the greater non-academic world. My experience uh, has been pretty incredible teaching inmates how to write fiction. I guess on the one hand, because I get to go in and I get to become excited with a student about something that they're excited about. I mean, that's incredible. Most of these students are living, all of these students are living highly codified lives where they dress the same and they're encouraged to look the same. Their behavior has to be the same. Uh, uh, their environment looks the same. Um, and I get to meet them as an individual and I get to let them share something with me that is something that they're passionate about and something that hopefully is an expression of themselves in some way. Um, I think that's profound, you know. Uh, I think the other thing is that uh, where else do we get to speak about this crazy, big, ambivalent, ambiguous situation that we call being a human being today? Um, you know, I'm not sure that it happens, uh, at least to the degree to which we're able to do it, we're able to talk about lived experience. Is this how someone would behave or act? Is this what someone would look like? Um, I love the arts for that, and I love the fact that uh, within the university situation, within the prison situation, there's a space for that. And I think there's a value um, uh, to that, even if it's not one that is uh, specifically practical in terms of working towards some skill or some uh, uh, specific end goal, other than, you know, what does it mean to be a human being today? Um, just getting to talk about that a little bit, I think, is uh, 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 profoundly fun and enlightening for me. Um, teaching the humanities is um, incredibly beneficial. The benefits just uh, manifest in other ways than the practical courses do. Um, for example, my philosophy class is essentially just critically thinking about important concepts. So, um, and you can just see, like throughout the semester, just the mechanisms of thoughts changing and the worldviews changing, and um, those things translate directly into day-to-day -day behavior. So, obviously. Um, that's very important, especially for the true mission of what I think prison should be. I'm very thankful to have been able to hear Johnny and Pastor Benny speak about their first person perspective about how education really, um, the values of education in prison. Uh, I'm interested in hearing your guys' from more of a voyeur's perspective from the outside, how you see the benefit and value of education manifested in your classrooms. Because as you're saying, I mean, I see day to day how these, these people are engaging with material and how they're changing in the classroom. So I'd like to get more of your guys' experience with that. I think the previous comment um, about like the codification of being a person incarcerated is really something that I think comes out here, which is that it's, it's amazing to see somebody who's kind of maybe in some ways sort of resigned to their life being highly controlled and not having certain levels of autonomy, 
But then getting the opportunity to expand and engage in concepts and theories uh, that they wouldn't otherwise have engaged with. So they get to think, well, what do I think is a proper moral theory? And they get to look inside their own minds and their hearts and think, what's right for me? And you can see them get excited when they start relating topics to their own lives and their own preferences and developing their own views. And as an outsider, like that's an amazing process to watch. It's what I love about teaching. It's, and I feel like every class, there's a moment in which someone says something, they make a point, or they come up with a really unique criticism, and I get to say, like, I haven't heard anything on that, you should write that down, right? That's a really good idea. And the excitement helps me stay excited. And so it's sort of like a feedback loop. And I think that's probably the best thing about getting to watch the importance of education in somebody's life. I'd also say that that is something that's very unique to teaching within the prison environment. It's something that I've never had happen to me as much, at least, in a university setting. And oh God, it's my favorite thing to do. Um, so the intention for my course when I first pitched it was to have these women who are very, very close to being released within the next few months to a year send them out with a completed polished resume or at least a draft of their resume as well as interview skills and ways to present the time that they have had behind bars in a way that they can get a job and have a career and not end up back in prison. And I've heard from many of my students, probably more than half of the class, the last time I was in here, I did this. The last time I was in, I took this course, and this didn't help me, and this and that. And, and they're all really excited to build a resume, and I can see within them that they really, really don't want to come back this time. And my class is on Sunday mornings, very early Sunday mornings, 8.30 in the morning. And these women work five to six days every week, um, all day, full-time jobs, and they still roll out of bed really excited to be in my class and they'll come with resumes done. If we give them edits, they'll rewrite their whole resumes because they can't use computers and they'll come in. I have a woman who has writ written two different resumes and two different color cover letters for different careers that she wants and that's so awesome to watch and watching them build these resumes and, and move forward in the course and, and really building these skills and seeing the excitement they have to get out and use the skills that they're getting in this course to get them a job that they want is really exciting to watch. And I feel like I'm making a difference in their lives because of it. I think um, with biology and the sciences, uh, what we're teaching is, in addition to education, um, in and of itself, we're, we're also teaching a specific kind of way of looking at the world um, through the scientific method, critically and evidence-based. And I think this is um, this can be this is new to most of the students we have. And I think it um, it allows for some. At first, they come in similarly thinking, "Well, I'm just going to learn some stuff about plants, or I'm going to learn about you know, how muscles work. I'm going to learn about you know what any other thing about how the nervous system works." But <coughs> One of the big things we, we do is instead we give them the tools to look at, like a scientist, when something comes out in the news about some sort of vaccine or some sort of something that's coming out, a new medicine, um, we give them the tools to critically look at that and discuss it with each other and talk about what they think about that. Um, and so in addition to education, we're, we're teaching science literacy, which um, as our speakers mentioned already today, I would want my neighbors to be science literate, and these, these are going to be my neighbors. So that's one of the major benefits we, we think about education. So if you haven't noticed, there's a lot of really idealistic people sitting up here. <laughs> and some really nice, young, idealistic people, which is great. Um, not to throw a wet blanket on all of this, but at the end of my semester, last uh, last semester, I was just kind of talking with some of the guys, at you know, talking to them about what they thought about these ASU uh, classes, and they kind of mentioned, you know, it's 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 almost like it's a diversion for them. Um, so at the very least, it's a moment that they have to get away from 
the normal types of conversations they have and the normal types of interactions they have in the prison. Um, and they, they expressed a lot of gratitude in being able to step away from all of that for a moment and talk about and learn new things. Um, so at the very least, that's what they're getting. Um, now, all of us up here will tell you it's much, much more than that, but that's the minimum, and that's still, I think, a good thing. Um, I think we're all benefiting a lot, uh, you know, as far as like teaching uh, techniques and, and getting experience. For me personally, I wanted to practice the Socratic method. And the interesting thing about the prison is we're restricted on the types of technology we can use and the types of uh, activities we can do in class, right? So we can't show videos. So a, a component of my classes is I show a video as a case study and then we respond to it. Well, I can't show the video in my class. So how do I make an engaging case study for the prisoners that we can talk about? So then um, it's more on me to be you know, presenting this material. And so it's been a really good experience for me to be able to practice, uh, you know, my, my presentation skills, my ability to ask a question, get a response, and then come back with a backup question to that response. Um, so those are just my thoughts, I guess. Could you repeat the question? I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, <laughs> I think it was how we see, or how you see, the values and benefits education manifested personally as an outsider. Or you can spitball, you know, just off that. How do we, I see it in the out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like how do I? As a teacher, how do you see that manifested through your students? In the classroom? How do I see what benefits of education? The benefits of education? Yeah. I think that everyone already talked a lot about it and already mentioned it a lot in the previous questions. Uh, but I think it's very beneficial. Um, I mean, on a personal perspective, uh, for me, education has been what has made me take many decisions that I never even dreamed of or even thought about to be able to take in the present. And just being at, at Perryville and seeing that uh, taking my classes, giving them also, uh, oh, giving them opportunities to uh, of things to do whenever they leave is just very well. And I'll just move. Um, hmm. I, I wanted to maybe piggyback just a little bit off Gable's uh, first point and say that uh, I'm not sure how idealistic I am. I care a lot about other people, um, especially on a person-to-person -person basis. Uh, fiction is an act of communication, and when it comes to communication, you need somebody on the other end for that communication to be meaningful and impactful. And I get to be that person on the other end of somebody trying to communicate something with somebody. And that's great, right? Um, I think that for me, that's really the thing that matters. Um, you know, I teach the arts, and the arts, if you didn't know, is about joy and pleasure and fun. That's awesome. <laughs> I mean, I get to go into a situation which is, you know, designed to be probably less than pleasurable, right? And encourage a little bit of pleasure and joy and fun and silliness. And those moments that mean the most to me are the moments where, you know, I get a bunch of guys kind of laughing and having a little fun for a second, loosening up, right? Um, I think that probably matters for the environment within the prison itself because these guys are building connections between each other, right? Which I think is useful and important. I think it's useful for them individually. You know, Gable spoke about, at the minimum, these guys are getting a diversion from a life that, you know, they themselves would, ha would not have chosen for themselves, and that's great. It's, an, uh, it's a moment of choice, individuality. Um, you know, from an outside perspective, I also guess I wanted to say, you know, I've told plenty of people that, you know, why can't I see them on Friday? Well, I'm going down to Florence to teach a creative writing class. And none of them ever look at me and go, you're teaching a creative writing class to prisoners, what's with that? What they always say is, what's that like? What's it like to be inside a prison? What are the guys like? Do you ever feel unsafe? And I get to turn around and say, I love doing it. It's the highlight of my week. The guys are phenomenal. I never feel unsafe. It's always a great experience. Right? And in just those little ways, I get to change the mindset of the people that I know about what being a felon is like, what being a prisoner is like, 
what it means to be in a prison. And I think that that can potentially be far more profound than anything that I could ever give to these guys as a writing teacher, right? Um, so the effect that it's had on me as a teacher and I imagine the effect it's had on them has really been profound. <clears throat> Uh, the ways I see uh, these classes manifest is that they manifest in subtle ways, like through conversation and through debate with one another, and, um, but they're very important. And um, you can just see, just as the classes go week by week and as they discuss these different concepts, you can just like see their worldviews being changed, them being open to new ideas, altering their, um, what, their worldviews, let's just say that again. And, um, you referred to it earlier as like a voyeuristic perspective, and um, I wish that was a perspective everybody could see, not just us, because um, as we talked about earlier, um, people that are incarcerated are often depicted as having some innate criminal um, sense to them, but um, that's just completely unfounded, and this um, having that perspective is, is really helpful in um, disbanding that. I have two questions to make it wrap this up. Um, I would like to piggyback after a gentleman with a wet blanket. Um, so I feel like we've all experienced a struggle uh, at least a couple of times teaching in these environments. And um, I, I'm, I'm curious if you had one thing you could choose to reform, what it would be. About education? Yeah, specifically about, you know, within reason, um, with our, our experience in the classroom. I think for me, it would be easier access for them to have resources, like easier access to resources. I find that, and certainly for me, and I think for them as well, it's a challenge because I bring readings for next week, the week before. And they're usually 20 to 40 pages. Sometimes they're quite difficult readings. And I feel like if I could present them with a list in advance and they had access to these materials in a library, they could read them at a pace that's more comfortable for themselves. Um, I think sometimes because I have to first bring the materials, they, they feel like they're dependent on me and they, they, they're not as inquisitive. They're not thinking, oh, this is an interesting topic. I wonder what books in the library might also speak to this. And I've gotten questions about, uh, you know, well, what other things can I be reading that's about this? And I feel like I don't, I don't know what's in the libraries, and so I can't just suggest anything, right? And, then, and that's kind of, I think, a hindrance, is that there's only so much investigation that they can do. And I think if we had more, more books, so we had more access, to resources for them, uh, they could be much more inquisitive and learn much more on their own. So the thing that I wish that I could change the most is kind of the stringent regulations that they face when they get out. Um, one of the first activities that I had my students do um, when I was there for the first class is I gave them journals and I had them write down their goals, specifically their career goals, but some other goals as well. And a few of them raised their hand and said, I don't know what I can do. Not because they don't know what skills they have, but they don't know what they will be allowed to do. So I did some research myself and the number of licenses that Arizona does not allow um, individuals with felonies to get after they get out is very, very long. Um, I had one girl who really wanted to do hair when she got out and you cannot get a license to do hair if you have a felony. And to watch her face kind of drop when she found out that was really disheartening because a lot of them will not be able to do the goals that they have for themselves, not because they can't reach the skills, but because our regulations tell them that they can't do it. So I wish that for a lot of them, they would be able to show that they can do these things after they get out and they put all these work into their resumes or their interview skills, but there's still so many things that they won't be allowed to do because they're in that box and they have to check a box on their applications for the rest of their lives. So that's where I'm at. I'm not sure if this is, falls under something that needs to be reformed, but it's definitely a major challenge. Um, almost every other biology class you will take anywhere involves a pretty comprehensive set of laboratory experiments. Um, and that's something that's obviously very difficult to do in this kind of environment. Um, but 
We're working on possibilities to do that. Um, we've seen other, I think two years ago, there was an excellent presentation from Alabama where they were doing labs in the prisons. And I think it's, it's such an important part of uh, biology and science education is using the scientific method in your own way to decide something you want to study and then you know, putting out a plan, testing it. Um, and, and that's difficult to do in, in these kinds of, in the constraints of this environment. So I think access to Pell Grants is probably the biggest reform I can think of. Um, though I think the research probably needs to either be better or more proactive about promoting the findings. We talk about uh, education reducing recidivism, um, and I think most of us intuitively sort of believe that or hope that being educated reduces the likelihood that someone will do something again that will put them back in prison. The issue with that is there's a big selection problem. Because the type of person who's going to seek after education while in prison is also probably the same type of person who's less likely to repeat offend, independent of whether or not they got that education. And that's a big problem, I think, in the research that needs to do a better job of kind of disentangling that and sort of communicating that finding that no, there is actually something about education that actually does reduce recidivism independent of the selection problem. Um, so that's kind of my thoughts on that. I think the kind of reform we might need is, I'll, I'll just go around language because I'm just very into learning languages, well, especially Spanish. I think there is a need for uh, not just in Arizona, but just the country in general, for to have people see the value in learning another language, and not just like I mentioned, not just to get another job, but to have uh, to be able to better communicate with um, um, your community in general and with any profession you're able to decide to work in. Just keep it short. Um, this is a bit of a tough question for me. I guess because I, as a teacher in the uh, prison teaching program, I'm often subject to rules that, as in regarding what I can teach and what I can do, that um, I don't necessarily see the justification for, and yet I'm not going to assume just because I can't see it or understand it that there isn't a really good reason <laughs> for its existence. So I'm always, I guess, apprehensive along those lines to suggest changes uh, because I really you know, don't know what kind of effect they could have and uh, what was the justification or reason for them being there in the first place. Um, you know, maybe the one thing that I have, which is rather minor, is uh, you know, I spoke a little bit before about what I love about fiction is that you know, whether it's good, bad, right, wrong, just silly, schlocky entertainment or the most profound Dostoevskian you know, existential tragedy, it's all asking the question, you know, what does it mean to be a human being? Um, you know, and uh, every Tuesday I have to send in my material to get it, you know, okayed by the higher ups. Um, and uh, in the prison environment, that question gets circumscribed. Um, you know, sex and violence are not what it means to be a human being in the prison. That's probably understandable, but <laughs> in terms of being a fiction teacher, you know, yeah, sex and violence probably are part of the human condition. <laughs> Um, you know, and should that change? I have no idea. You know, what I can say is that um, I've certainly changed a heck of a lot as a teacher teaching in this environment. Uh, you know, when I teach an undergraduate, I can assume a certain light, level line of, of proficiency, either in narrative storytelling or language arts, which I can't necessarily assume on the part of the prisoners. I've reformed myself a heck of a lot um, as a human being and as a teacher as a result of this experience. Um, I'm a stronger educator today because of this. and. Um, that's a reform that's taken place that uh, uh, I think is impactful both from the students that I teach in the prison and the students that I teach outside the prison. So. Um, I don't know if it's a type of reform per se, but um, I think being able to give these people um, actual college credits would be huge. Um, like we've been talking about, a lot of these individuals are worried about like the practical applications of how they're spending their time. And um, being able to get actual college credits for these classes, I think could just change the um, the cultural connotations of education within the prison, and in, um, in really beneficial ways. 
the risk of running over our time, I'd like to quickly end on a positive note. So I know um, I feel personally blessed to be involved with these really inspiring individuals and being able to be with them in the classroom. And I've kind of become a recruiter of sorts for prison educators. And I'd like to ask you guys, if you could pitch someone a quick recruitment, um, what would you say to them? I guess I would say that um, there are some there are some difficulties and adjustments you have to make in teaching in a prison environment, but all of those are ultimately overcome. And all the prejudices that uh, I certainly had going in, and I know a lot of other people have, about like the risk to safety and things like that, um, are by and large unfounded. Right? I don't feel any different in my, uh, in my classroom in the prison than I do in my classroom at ASU. And I think that once people stop being scared of the idea of inmates, they'll see that they're just people like everybody else. And they have a desire to learn just like everybody else. And that if anything, you're going to impact those people more because they see that you're willing to look at them like a person in a society that has a tendency not to look at them that way. And I think that that's important on an interpersonal level, and it's important to you as an educator. I've had a similar sort of experience from someone in the panel, I can't remember who said it, um, but people ask me what I'm doing on Sunday mornings, and I'm like, oh, sorry, I can't do anything, I'm going to prison. And they're, they ask me the same thing, what's that like? Why do you teach there? Do you like it? That's cool. And I always tell them, I'm like, do you want to teach for someone that wants to learn? And if they say yes, I'm like, cool, you should do it then because you're going to learn the material better. They are really, really excited for you to come in and it's just a great experience. And I've had a lot of people that have shown genuine interest in the program just because I've told them how receptive all of the students are. Yeah, I would say it's um, the most uh, rewarding and challenging teaching experience I've had. And I've taught many different kinds of classes. Um, I'd also say that it's, uh, if I was trying to pitch this to someone, it would be, uh, you know, it's, it's a great way to become a better teacher, um, both by, like I said earlier, having to work within a framework and also uh, the students we have make you a better teacher because they ask the most difficult questions you would ever think of. Ever, you don't have an answer for and you have to go look it up. Um, and also, uh, we get to work with, in our case, specifically CEPT Roberto Norales, who is just amazing. And, and we learn a lot from uh, teaching with her and getting her input on how to teach. She's there every day. Um, so that's, that's what I want. So I come from the School of Public Affairs here at ASU. And when I first found out about prison education program, I thought, okay, I'll go find the person in my school that does this. I looked around and there wasn't anybody. Um, which, kind of surprising, you'd expect the School of Public Affairs to have someone associated with prison education. You know? Um, I've tried to recruit my classmates, some of my, PA, my fellow PhD students, and not very successful. Um, I think what we need to do is get a big pile of money to start paying people like us, and then we'll find some more people, maybe. Um, I think for PhD students, the incentives are kind of off. A lot of them want to focus on their research and get a job in academia, and taking an entire Friday off to go ride in a car at your own expense um, kind of takes a special kind of crazy to do that. So maybe we just need more money. <laughs> I think just kind of like on a practical note, um, I always tell my uh, colleagues, well, you can put it on your CV, professional development opportunities. But more than that, uh, being a volunteer here has made me actually feel appreciated as a teacher, probably for the first time. Um, I've felt very, very safe. So when Dr. Bell says you're going to be safe, she really meant it. Um, and it's also a very rewarding experience. And I think the biggest note was like helping it to break with the stereotypes. Because you always see those mugshots on the news and it's very, very scary. But when I saw them and I saw their mugshot on their IDs, I was like, this is a totally different person. So, um, yeah. Um, I think that my pitch would be fairly simple. 
And I have to say that I've, you know, I've told a lot of people what I'm doing with my Fridays. And um, after they ask me what it's like, they always say, I can never do that. Oh, I can never do that. And usually I just let them say that, right? Because um, I'm not sure those are the type of people <laughs> that are necessarily going to be the most successful um, in that environment. But my pitch would be uh, very simple, which is you get to bring a little bit of joy and relief to somebody's day. That's profound. I mean, you know, all these other bigger societal questions are important, and we need to talk about them, we need to ask them. They're an important justification for what we do. But, you know, I get to go in and I get to have a little fun, bring in a little fun to somebody else's day. That's the best. <laughs> um, I would just tell anyone who's interested that it is just, it's a genuinely life-changingly beneficial experience for all parties involved. And um, I also think that many of us have been afforded certain privileges that people who are incarcerated have not had. And um, I think it's important to take advantage of those privileges in ways that benefit everybody. Well, I'm starving, so I think we're going to end there. But thank you so much, everyone, for doing what you do and also for being here. Thank you.